White Cobra present Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, adapted and directed by Rebecca Cockcroft. Episode 1 It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighbourhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered the rightful property of someone or other of their daughters. My dear Mr Bennet, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Is it so? <laughs> Would you not want to know who has taken it? You want to tell me and I have no objection to hearing it. Oh, why, my dear, you must know. Mrs Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, by the name of Bingley. Four or five thousand a year. Oh, what a fine thing for our girls. How so? How can it affect them? Oh, my dear Mr Bennet, how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. Is that his design in settling here? Design? Oh, nonsense. How can you talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them. And therefore, you must visit him as soon as he comes. I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may go, or you may send them by themselves, which perhaps will be still better, for as you are as handsome as any of them, Mr Bingley may like you the best of the party. <laughs> oh, my dear, you flatter me. But consider your daughters, for it will be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. I will send a few lines by you to assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he chooses of the girls. Though I must throw in a good word for my little Lizzie. I desire you will do no such thing. Lizzie is not a bit better than the others. And I'm sure she's not half so handsome as Jane. Or half as good-humoured as Lydia. They have none of them much to recommend them. They're all silly and ignorant like other girls. Mr Bennet. You take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion for my poor nerves. Oh, you mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I've heard you mention them with consideration these last twenty years at least. Oh, you do not know what I suffer. But I hope you'll get over it and live to see many young men of four thousand a year come into the neighbourhood. <laughs> It'll be no use to us if twenty such should come since you will not visit them. Depend upon it, my dear, that when there are twenty, I will visit them all. Mr Bennet was among the earliest of those who waited on Mr Bingley. He had always intended to visit him, though to the last always assuring his wife that he should not go. Until the evening after the visit was paid, she had no knowledge of it. That is a fine hat, Lizzie. I hope Mr Bingley will like it. We are not in a way to know what Mr Bingley likes, since we are not to visit. But you forget, Mamma, that we shall meet him at the assemblies, and that Mrs Long promised to introduce mm. him. Well, I don't believe Mrs Long will do any such thing, Lizzie. She has two nieces of her own. Oh, she's a selfish, hypocritical woman, and I have no opinion of her. No, oh, I am sick of Mr Bingley. I am sorry to hear that. If I had known as much this morning, I certainly would not have called on him. Oh, oh my dear! It's very unlucky, but as I have actually paid the visit, oh, we cannot escape the acquaintance now. Oh, how good it was in you, my dear Mr Bennet! Oh, what a good joke! Oh, oh what an excellent mm. father you have, girls! Oh, oh, if I can see but one of my daughters happily settled at Netherfield, and all the others equally well married, oh, I shall have nothing to wish for. In a few days, Mr Bingley returned Mr Bennet's visit, 
and sat about ten minutes with him in his library. He had entertained hopes of being admitted to a sight of the young ladies, of whose beauty he had heard much, but he saw only the father. Girls! Girls! Come quickly! What is it, Mama? It's Mr Bingley, Lydia. Look out of the window there. Jane! Lizzie! Oh, what a fine blue coat he's wearing, Kitty. And a black horse. Oh, I wish we could have met him, girls. But we will have to wait a little longer to discern quite how handsome he really is. Only until the assembly on Tuesday, Mama. <laughs> mm, yes, but Mrs Long says he is to return from town with a large party of twelve ladies. Twelve ladies, girls! Who knows how any of us are supposed to properly make his acquaintance with so many ladies present? There now, I see only two ladies, Mama. Mariah, do you know who they are? I understand they're Mr Bingley's sisters. One of them is married to Mr Hurst, the gentleman there. And the tall gentleman? Ah, uh, that is Mr Bingley's friend, Mr Darcy. I have heard he has a large estate in Derbyshire. He is far handsomer than Mr Bingley, is he not, Lizzie? Lydia! And ten thousand a year. Well, I believe I can see how that should make him quite handsome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're coming this way. Settle down, girls. Smile, Jane! My dear Mrs Bennet, Mr Bingley has expressed a desire to be introduced to you and your girls. Well, how wonderful! Thank you, Sir William. Mr Bingley, these are my eldest, Jane and Elizabeth, and my youngest, Lydia. Mary, you can see just there. She's so devoted to reading. And Kitty is engaged with a dance at present. Utterly delighted to meet you all. Miss Bennet, may I be so bold as to claim the next dance? Of course you may, Mr Bingley. And perhaps your friend would... Um... Oh, <laughs> do forgive me. This is my dear friend, Mr Darcy. Mr Darcy, welcome to Hertfordshire, sir. You will find many a pretty girl to dance with this evening, I'm sure. I do not dance, madam. Excuse me. Come, Darcy, I hate to see you standing about by yourself in a stupid manner. You would much better dance. I certainly shall not. Your sisters are engaged, and there is not another woman in the room whom it would not be a punishment to me to stand up with. <sighs> Upon my honour. I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life as I have this evening. And there are several of them who are uncommonly pretty. You are to dance with Miss Bennet, the only handsome girl in the room. <laughs> she is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. But, uh, but there is one of her sisters who is very pretty, and dare I say very agreeable. Which do you mean? Miss Elizabeth. <laughs> she is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. Well, Mariah, perhaps he is not so handsome after all. Good night, Sir William. Good night, Miss Bennet. Oh, Lizzie. Oh, Mr Bingley is just what a young man ought to be. Sensible, good-humoured, lively. I never saw such happy manners. He is also handsome, Jane, which a young man ought likewise to be, if he possibly can. <laughs> I was very much flattered by his asking me to dance a second time. I did not expect such a compliment. Did you not? What could be more natural than his asking you again? Well, he certainly is very agreeable. And I give you leave to like him. You have liked many a stupider person. Lizzie! Oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, we have had a most delightful evening. Oh, I wish you'd been there. Mm -hmm. Jane was so admired. Everybody said how well she looked. And Mr. Bingley thought her quite beautiful and danced with her twice. And she was the only creature in the room that he asked a second time. <laughs> First of all, he asked Miss Lucas. Oh, when I was so vexed to see him stand up with her... And then the 2.30 dance with Miss King, 
and the two fourth with Mariah Lucas, and the two fifth with Jane again, and the two sixth with Lizzie. Say no more of his partners. Oh, that he had sprained his ankle in the first dance. Come now, my dear. I was asleep. Oh, my dear, I'm quite delighted with him. <sighs> He's so excessively handsome. Oh, and his sisters are charming women. I never in my life saw anything more elegant than their dresses. Well, I dare say the lace upon Mrs Hurst's gown. No more on fashions, I beg you. <sighs> well, then let me tell you of the most disagreeable gentleman, Mr Bingley's friend. He slighted our poor Lizzie. Mm -hmm. But I can assure you that Lizzie does not lose much by not suiting his fancy, for he is a most disagreeable, horrid man. Not at all worth pleasing. <laughs> not handsome enough to dance with. Oh, I quite detest the man. <sighs> Mr Bingley's party at Netherfield had not experienced quite so much delight as the Bennets. Did you not enjoy the assembly, Darcy? I saw only a collection of people in whom there was little beauty and no fashion. Oh, come now, Darcy. I've never met with more pleasant people or prettier girls in my life. Miss Bennet, I will acknowledge as pretty, but she smiled too much. I thought her a very sweet girl. Indeed, sister, I cannot imagine an angel more beautiful. I have heard the second daughter to be a local beauty. She a beauty? I should as soon call her mother a wit. <laughs> 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 Indeed, even despite her mother, I should not be sorry to get to know more of her. Quite so, sister. I hear that Miss Eliza Bennet's reputed beauty was not even enough to tempt you to dance, Mr Darcy. No, Miss Bingley, but then I am not fond of dancing with those whom I am not well acquainted. Well, I found everybody to be most kind and attentive to me. There had been no formality, no stiffness... Indeed, I soon felt acquainted with all the room. Yeah, I, I shall like it here a great deal. Within a short walk of the Bennetts' family home in Longbourn lived Sir William and Lady Lucas. The eldest of their children, Charlotte, a sensible, intelligent young woman, was Elizabeth's closest friend. That Charlotte and her sister Maria and the Miss Bennets should meet to talk over a ball was absolutely necessary. You began the evening well, Charlotte. You were Mr Bingley's first choice. Yes, Mrs Bennet, but he seemed to like his second better. Oh, well, you mean Jane, I suppose, because he danced with her twice. I overheard Mr Bingley say he thought of the prettiest girl in the room. <gasps> Oh, upon my word, Maria! Well, that is very decided indeed. But that does seem as... But, uh, however, it, it, it may come to nothing, you know. Mr Darcy is not so well worth listening to as his friend, is he? Poor Eliza, to be only just tolerable. Mm. Well, it would be quite a misfortune to be liked by him. Disagreeable man. Another time, Lizzie, I would not dance with him if I were you. I believe, ma'am, I may safely promise you never to dance with him. One cannot wonder that so very fine a young man, with family, fortune, everything in his favour, should think highly of himself. If I may so express it, he has a right to be proud. I could easily forgive his pride if he had not mortified mine. Will you take a turn around the garden with me, Charlotte? I believe that Mr Bingley admires Jane greatly, and she him. If I can perceive her regard for him, he must be a simpleton indeed not to discover it too. Remember, Eliza, that he does not know Jane's disposition as you do. It is sometimes a disadvantage to be so very guarded. If a woman conceals her affection from the object of it, 
she may lose the opportunity of fixing him. But if a woman is partial to a man and does not endeavour to conceal it, he must find it out. Perhaps he must, if he sees enough of her. Jane should therefore make the most of every half hour in which she can command his attention. When she is secure of him, there will be more leisure for falling in love as much as she chooses. <laughs> you talk as if being in love is not a consideration when it comes to a happy marriage, Charlotte. Happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. It is better to know as little as possible of the defects of the person with whom you are to pass your life. <laughs> you make me laugh, Charlotte, but it is not sound. You would never act in this way yourself. Occupied in observing Mr Bingley's attentions to her sister, Elizabeth was far from suspecting that she was herself becoming an object of some interest in the eyes of his friend. What does Mr Darcy mean, Charlotte, by listening to my conversation with Colonel Forster? That is a question which Mr Darcy only can answer. But if he does it any more, I shall certainly let him know that I see what he is about. Look, he's coming this way. Do not ask him, Eliza. Did you not think, Mr Darcy, that I expressed myself uncommonly well just now, when I was teasing Colonel Forster to give us a ball at Meryton? With great energy. But it is always a subject which makes a lady energetic. You are severe on us. Ah, Miss Bennet. Mr Darcy. Sir William. What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr Darcy. There is nothing like dancing after all. I consider it as one of the first refinements of polished society. Certainly, Sir William, although every savage can dance. Now, you must allow me to present Mr Liza to you as a very desirable partner. You cannot refuse to dance, I'm sure, when so much beauty is before you. Indeed, sir. I have not the least intention of dancing. You excel so much in the dance, Miss Eliza, that it is cruel to deny me the happiness of seeing you. And though this gentleman dislikes the amusement in general, he can have no objection, I am sure, to oblige us for one half hour. Mr Darcy is all politeness. He is indeed. But considering the inducement, my dear Miss Eliza, for who would object to such a partner? I thank you, sir. However, I do not desire to dance. Excuse me. Sir William, will you allow me to steal away my friend? Oh, of course, Miss Bingley, of course. I came to rescue you, Darcy. I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this manner, in such society. Your conjecture is totally wrong, I assure you. My mind was more agreeably engaged. Oh, is that so? Pray tell. I've been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes can bestow. And to whom would these fine eyes belong? Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Oh, Miss Elizabeth Bennet? I am all astonishment. How long has she been such a favourite? And pray... When am I to wish you joy? Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? You will have a charming mother-in-law indeed. And of course, she will always be at Pemberley with you. <laughs> yes, do let the portraits of your charming new sisters be placed in the gallery at Pemberley. But as for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not have it taken. For what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes? It would not be easy, indeed, to catch their expression. But their colour and shape, the eyelashes so remarkably fine, might be copied, I'm sure. The youngest Miss Bennets were often tempted to walk the one mile from Longbourn to the village of Meryton to pay duty to their aunt and contrive to learn some news from her. At present, all talk was of the recent arrival of the militia to the neighbourhood. 
And Aunt Philip says the regiment is to remain all winter. And that Colonel Forster had been persuaded to give a ball. I shall need a new bonnet for our walks into Meryton, Kitty, in case we should come upon the officers. And I shall. You can have one of mine, for I shan't wear them. But they would suit you tolerably well, I'm sure. I shouldn't think Captain Carter would think less of you for wearing mine. From all that I can collect by your manner of talking, you must be two of the silliest girls in the country. I have suspected it some time, but I am now convinced. Papa! I'm astonished, my dear, that you should be so ready to think your own children silly. If my children are silly, I must hope to be always sensible of it. Yes, but as it happens, they are all of them very clever. This is the only point I flatter myself on which we do not agree. I must so far differ from you as to think our two youngest daughters uncommonly foolish. Oh, I remember the time when I liked a red coat myself very well. And indeed, so I do, still in my heart. And if a smart young colonel with five or six thousand a year should want one of my girls, I shall not say nay to him. A note for Miss Bennet has arrived, ma'am. Well, Jane, who's it from? What is it about? What does it say? Oh, it is from Miss Bingley. She invites me to dine with them today. Oh, the gentlemen are to dine out with the officers. With the officers? I wonder my aunt did not tell us of that. Oh, dining out? Oh, well, that's very unlucky. May I have the carriage? No, my dear, you'd better go on horseback. Because it seems likely to rain, and then you must stay all night. Her hopes were answered. Jane had not been gone long before it rained hard. The rain continued the whole evening without intermission. Jane certainly could not come back. <laughs> oh, this was a lucky idea of mine indeed. <laughs> Till the next morning, however, she was not aware of all the felicity of her contrivance. Breakfast was scarcely over when a servant from Netherfield brought a note for Elizabeth. Jane is ill. Accepting a sore throat and headache, there is nothing much the matter, but my kind friends will not hear of my returning till I am better. Well, I should think not. Well, my dear, if she should die, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr Bingley. No, oh, people do not die of trifling in little colds. She will be taken good care of. I must go to her. Uh, but the carriage is not to be had, Lizzie. I shall walk. It is merely three miles. The distance is nothing when one has motive. Oh, how could you be so silly as to think of such a thing in all this dirt? You will not be fit to be seen when you get there. I shall be very fit to see Jane, which is all I want. We will go as far as Meryton with you. If we make haste, perhaps we may see something of Captain Carter before he goes to town with Denny. <laughs> Elizabeth continued her walk alone after Meryton, crossing field after field at a quick pace, jumping over stiles and springing over puddles with impatient activity, and found herself at last being shown into the breakfast room of Netherfield with weary ankles, dirty stockings and a face glowing with the warmth of exercise. Good Lord! Miss Bennet! I hope you will not consider me impertinent, but if you would be so kind as to show me my sister's room... I am anxious to see her. Of course, Miss Bennet. Harris, could you show Miss Elizabeth the way? Yes, sir. I told you, sister, her manners are very bad indeed. She has no conversation, no style, and none of her reputed beauty. She has nothing in short to recommend her. <laughs> but being an excellent walker... <laughs> I shall never forget her appearance. She really looked almost wild. Why must she be scampering about the country because her sister had a cold? And her hair, so untidy. Yes, and I hope you saw her petticoat six inches deep in mud. Oh, this was all lost upon me. I thought Miss Elizabeth Bennet looked remarkably well. Oh, her dirty petticoat quite escaped my notice. You observed it, Mr Darcy, I'm sure. You would not wish to see your sister make such an exhibition? Certainly not. 
and to walk three miles above her ankles in dirt and alone, quite alone. What could she mean by it? Well, you chose an affection for her sister. It's very pleasing. I am sure, Mr. Darcy, that this adventure has rather affected your admiration for her fine eyes. Oh, not at all. They were brightened by the exercise. I have an excessive regard for Miss Jane Bennet. She is really a very sweet girl, and I wish with all my heart she were well settled. But with such a father and mother and such low connections, I'm afraid there is no chance of it. I think I heard you say that their uncle is an attorney in Meryton. <laughs> yes, and they have another who lives somewhere near Cheapside. <laughs> They had uncles enough to fill all Cheapside, it would not make them one jot less agreeable. But it must very materially lessen their chance of marrying men of any consideration in the world. On Jane's request, Miss Bingley extended an invitation for Elizabeth to spend the night at Netherfield and sent for her clothes from Longbourn. A short while later, when she had the comfort of seeing Jane sleep, Elizabeth decided she should make an appearance downstairs. Will you join us for cards, Miss Bennet? No, thank you, Mrs Hurst. I should not like to break up a game if Jane called. I am content to read. Miss Eliza Bennet despises cards. She is a great reader and has no pleasure in anything else. I deserve neither such praise nor such censure. I am not a great reader and I have pleasure in many things. Should you like me to fetch you something else to read? I wish my collection were larger, for your benefit, and my own credit. <laughs> that is kind, Mr Bingley, but I can suit myself with what is in the room. What a delightful library you have at Pemberley, Mr Darcy. Well, it ought to be good. It has been the work of many generations. Charles, when you build your house, I wish it may be half as delightful as Pemberley. I would really advise you to make your purchase in that neighbourhood and take Pembley for a kind of model. There is not a finer county in England than Derbyshire. Oh, well, with all my heart, I will buy Pembley itself if Darcy will sell it. I should think it more possible to get Pembley by purchase than by imitation. Is Miss Darcy much grown since the spring? Will she be as tall as I am? I think she will. She's now about Miss Elizabeth Bennet's height. Or rather, taller. How oh, I long to see her again. I never met with anybody who delighted me so much. So extremely accomplished for her age. Her performance on the piano forte is exquisite. It is amazing to me how young ladies can all have patience to be so very accomplished as they all are. I cannot boast of knowing more than half a dozen in the whole range of my acquaintance that are really accomplished. Nor I, I'm sure. Then you must comprehend a great deal in your idea of an accomplished woman. Yes, I do comprehend a great deal in it. Oh, certainly. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages to deserve the word. All this she must possess, and to all this she must yet add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather wonder now at your knowing any. Are you so severe upon your own sex as to doubt the possibility of all this? I never saw such a woman. Oh, I know many women who answer that description. <coughs> Miss Bennet, your sister asks for you. Thank you. If you'll excuse me. Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room, and in the morning she requested to have a note sent to Longbourn, desiring her mother to visit Jane and form her own judgment of her situation. Mrs Bennet and her youngest daughter arrived shortly after breakfast. Mrs Bennet, I hope you've not found Miss Bennet worse than you expected. Indeed I have, sir. She is a great deal too ill to be moved. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness. Removed? <laughs> it must not be thought of. Uh, my sister, I am sure, will not hear of her removal. You may depend upon it, madam. 
that Miss Bennet will receive every possible attention while she remains with us. Well, I'm sure if it were not for such good friends, I do not know what would become of her, for she is very ill indeed, and suffers a vast deal, though with the greatest patience in the world. Which is always the way with her, for she has, without exception, the sweetest temper I have ever met with. I often tell my other girls they are nothing to her. You have a sweet room here, Mr Bingley. You will not think of quitting Hertfordshire in a hurry, I hope. Whatever I do is done in a hurry, and therefore, if I should resolve to quit Netherfield, well, I should probably be off in five minutes. <laughs> that is exactly what I should have supposed of you. Oh, you begin to comprehend me, do you? Oh, yes, I understand you perfectly. Lizzie, remember where you are. And do not run on in the wild manner that you are suffered to do at home. I did not know before that you were a studier of character. The country can in general supply but a few subjects for such a study. But people themselves alter so much that there is something new to be observed in them forever. The country is a vast deal pleasanter than town, is it not, Mr Bingley? When I'm in the country, I never wish to leave it. Aye, well that is because you have the right disposition. But that gentleman seemed to think the country was nothing at all. Indeed, Mamma, Mr Darcy only meant that there was not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in the town, which you must acknowledge to be true. Well, certainly, my dear, nobody said there were. But as to not meeting with many people in this neighbourhood, I believe there are few neighbourhoods larger. I know we dine with four and twenty families. Charlotte Lucas called yesterday. Well, the Lucases are a very good sort of girls, I assure you. It's a pity they are not handsome. And not that I think Charlotte's are very plain, but then she is our particular friend. Well, she seems a very pleasant young woman. Oh, dear, yes. But you must own she is very plain. Well, Lady Lucas herself has often said so, and envied me Jane's beauty. When Jane was only fifteen, there was a man at my brother Gardiner's in town, so much in love with her that my sister-in-law was sure he would make her an offer before we came away. But, however, he did not. Perhaps he thought her too young. However, he wrote some verses on her, and very pretty they were. And so ended his affection. I wonder who first discovered the efficacy of poetry in driving away love. I've been used to consider poetry as the food of love. Of a fine, stout, healthy love it may. But if it be only a slight, thin sort of inclination, I am convinced that one good sonnet will starve it entirely away. Mr Bingley, I do believe you promised on your first coming into the country that you would give a ball at Netherfield. I am perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement. And when your sister is recovered, you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. <sighs> Oh, oh yes, it would be much better to wait till Jane was well. And by that time, most likely Captain Carter would be at Meryton again. Mrs Bennet and her daughter then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane, leaving her own and her relations' behaviour to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr Darcy, the latter of whom, however, could not be prevailed on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bingley's witticisms on fine eyes. That evening, when the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister, and seeing her well guarded from cold, helped her into the drawing-room. Oh, Jane, I am excessively glad you are recovered enough to come down. We have missed your company, haven't we, Louisa? Oh, we have indeed. And while I do not wish to hurry your departure, it gives me great pleasure to see you so much improved. Now that the gentlemen are returned, shall we set up for cards? Sister, I have it on private intelligence that Mr Darcy does not care for cards this evening. Indeed. I have letters to write. Miss Bennet, you are feeling better, I hope. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you, sir. It is so wonderful to have you join us. Oh, shall I have uh, Harris pile the fire? I, I would not wish for you to, to suffer from the change of room. Uh, are you quite warm enough? Too warm, perhaps? I am quite well, thank you, Mr Bingley. Well, let us move you from this side of the fireplace, lest you be too close to the door. So, we are really not to have cards? Are we to read all evening? I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. 
<laughs> Have you a date in mind, Mr Bingley, for your promised ball? Oh, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Netherfield? I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball would be rather a punishment than a pleasure. Well, if you mean Darcy, he may go to bed if he chooses before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing. Hmm. Well, my sisters will be delighted to hear it, Mr Bingley. Well, I hope it is good news to all your sisters. And to you, Miss Bennet... How delighted your sister will be to receive such a letter, Mr Darcy. You write uncommonly fast. You're mistaken. I write rather slowly. Pray tell your sister that I long to see her and let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table. You give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again. At present I have not room to do them justice. Oh, <laughs> it is of no consequence. Shall we have some music, sister? Elizabeth could not help observing, despite Mrs Hurst's playing drawing the attention of the room, how frequently Mr Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She could only imagine that she drew his notice because there was something more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. Do not you feel a great inclination, Miss Elizabeth, to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel? Miss Elizabeth? Oh, I heard you. But I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste. But I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all. Now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare. Miss Eliza Bennet, let me persuade you to take a turn about the room. Will you join us, Mr Darcy? I can only imagine two motives for your choosing to walk up and down the room together, and my joining would interfere with both of them. <laughs> what could he mean, Miss Eliza? Do you understand his meaning? Not at all. But depend upon it, he means to be severe on us. And our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. <laughs> no, I must demand an explanation. I have not the smallest objection to explaining myself. You either choose this method of passing the evening because you are in each other's confidence and have secret affairs to discuss, or because you are conscious that your figures appear to the greatest advantage in walking. If the first, I'd be completely in your way, and if the second, I could admire you much better as I sit by the fire. <laughs> Shocking! I never heard anything so abominable. Excellent playing, as always, sister. How shall we punish him for such a speech? Nothing so easy. Tease him. Laugh at him. Oh, but Mr Darcy is not to be laughed at. Not to be laughed at? That is an uncommon advantage. I dearly love a laugh. Miss Bingley has given me more credit than can be. The wisest and best of men, nay, the wisest and best of their actions, may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly there are such people, but I hope I am not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. It has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses, which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule. Such as vanity and pride... Vanity is a weakness indeed, but pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will always be under good regulation. Your examination of Mr Darcy is over, I presume. And pray, what is the result? I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr Darcy has no defect. He owns it himself without disguise. No, I have made no such pretension. I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. That is a failing indeed. But you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. 
There is, I believe, in every disposition, a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect, which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is to hate everybody. And yours is willfully to misunderstand them. Jane was sufficiently recovered to plan their return home for Sunday. Despite Mrs Bennet's contrivances that they should remain until Tuesday, a full week since Jane left Longbourn. The master of the house heard with real sorrow that they were to go so soon. On Monday morning, at breakfast, Mrs Bennet ensured both girls were aware of her disappointment to have them home. Oh, Lizzie! It was very wrong to trouble Mr Bingley so to insist on their carriage to bring you home. And Jane, you could have caught cold again. And I would never forgive you, Lizzie, if she did not recover. I am glad to have you back, Jane, Lizzie. The evening conversation had lost most of its animation and almost all of its sense with you absent. And you have missed all talk of Colonel Forster's wedding. His new wife is quite young, Lizzie, and we have both decided to become great friends. And me, Lydia. Well, yes, I suppose, but I am going to be her particular friend. It is so unfair. I met her first, Lizzie. It should be me that is a closer friend. And Mrs. Oh, well, Bennet, I, I hope, my dear, that you have ordered a good dinner today, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. Well, who do you mean, my dear? I know of nobody that is coming, I'm sure. The person of whom I speak is a person whom I never saw in the whole course of my life. About a month ago I received this letter, and about a fortnight ago I answered it, for I thought it a case of some delicacy and requiring early attention. It is from my cousin, Mr Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. Oh, my dear, pray do not talk of that odious man! Oh, I do think it's the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children. Nothing can clear Mr Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longbourn, but if you will listen to his letter, you may perhaps be a little softened by his manner of expressing himself. No, that I am sure I shall not. He begins. Dear Sir, the disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honoured father always gave me much uneasiness, and since I have had the misfortune to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach. <laughs> there you go, my dear. My mind is now made up on the subject, for having received ordination at Easter, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of the Right Honourable Lady Catherine de Burr, I cannot be otherwise than concerned at being the means of injuring your amiable daughters and beg leave to apologise for it, as well as to assure you of my readiness to make them every possible amends. If you should have no objection to receive me into your house, I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family on Monday, November 18th by four o'clock and shall probably trespass on your hospitality until the Saturday send night following. I remain, dear sir, with respectful compliments to your lady and daughters, your well-wisher and friend, William Collins. He must be an oddity, I think. I cannot make him out. Could he be a sensible man, sir? No, my dear, I think not. <laughs> I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. Mr Collins was punctual to his time and was received with great politeness by the whole family. Mr Bennet indeed said little, but Mr Collins seemed neither in need of encouragement nor inclined to be silent himself. Dinner is ready, ma'am. You have a very charming dining room, I see, Mrs Bennet. Thank you, Mr Collins. I have had the pleasure of being invited twice to dine with Lady Catherine de Bourgh at Rosings. I have never in my life witnessed such behaviour in a person of rank, such affability and condescension. Oh, why, Mr Collins, is that so? She has always spoken to me as she would any other gentleman. Some consider Lady Catherine to be proud, but I have never seen anything but affability in her. Well, that is so wonderful to hear. She has even condescended to advise me to marry as soon as I can, provided I choose with 
discretion, and once paid a visit to my parsonage, where she perfectly approved of all the alterations I have made, and even vouchsafed to suggest some herself. Indeed, the garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has only one daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and of very extensive property. She is a most charming young lady indeed. She is perfectly amiable and often condescends to drive by my home in her little phaeton and ponies. <laughs> has she been presented? Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town. And by that means, as I told Lady Catherine one day, has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. Her ladyship seemed pleased with the idea, and you may imagine that I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. <laughs> and these are the little things which please her ladyship, and it is a sort of attention which I conceive myself peculiarly bound to pay. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment or are the result of previous study? They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, and though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible. Mr Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society. The light in your breakfast room, Mrs Bennet, reminds me of the parlour at my own humble parsonage. Is that so, Mr Collins? Now that I have a good home, Mrs Bennet, and a very sufficient income, I must follow the advice of my esteemed patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, and find a suitable wife. It is my dearest wish that the new mistress of the Parsonage Heights might be found here at Longbourn, your uh, eldest daughter, I think. Uh, my uh, eldest daughter, we expect, is likely to very soon be engaged. Ah. As to my younger daughters, um, I could not take upon myself to say. Well, that is, I, I could not positively answer. But I do not know of any prepossession that might prevent it. Mama, Mama, Kitty and I are walking to Meryton to see Aunt Phillips. Well, Mr Collins would enjoy the walk too, girls, I'm sure. Oh. Uh, I had intended to speak to Mr Bennett with regards to his copy of Fordyce's sermons. Jane and Lizzie will be walking with you, will they not, Lydia? They are, Mama. Oh, then. In which case, it is settled. I am, in fact, much better fitted for a walker than a reader. <laughs> On arriving in Meryton, the younger Miss Bennets were immediately in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet indeed could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man, whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance. Who's that with Denny? I am quite sure I have never seen him in my life. What a shame he's not in regimentals. Lord, it would be such a joke to ask Denny. Denny! Denny! We thought you were still in town. Ah, oh, Miss Lydia Bennett. I have returned a little earlier than planned. Oh, please allow me to introduce my friend, Mr Wickham. Happily, he has accepted a commission and uh, joins us here in Meryton. Uh, Miss Bennett, Miss Elizabeth Bennett, Miss Kitty Bennett and Miss Lydia Bennett. This is our cousin. Mr. Collins. It is such a delight to meet with friends of my dear cousin. Well, happy news you're joining the regiment, Mr. Wickham. I hope you're enjoying Meryton so far, sir. Very much. I'm greatly looking forward to making many new and uh, charming acquaintances. Oh, you must come to our aunt's. I'm sure she should not mind officers accompanying us. Oh, look, Jane. It's Mr. Bingley. 
Oh, and he has his unpleasant friend with him. Oh, Miss Bennett. What a pleasant surprise. I was just on my way to Longbourn to inquire after you. You are recovered now, I see. Yes. Thank you, sir. I am quite well. We are all so grateful, sir, for your hospitality. Oh, no. (laughs) Not at all. I'm just delighted to see you so well. We are on our way to see our aunt, Mr Bingley. Oh, then I shall not detain you any longer. Good day to you all. Come on, Darcy. There you are, girls. I thought for a moment you had forgot your way. Not at all, Aunt. We were talking to Denny and our new friend, Mr Wickham. I told them they would be welcome to join us for luncheon. Indeed they would. I would gladly extend the invitation to you both. Oh, that is uncommonly kind, Mrs Phillips. But we have matters to attend to that require our attention elsewhere. Another day, then, perhaps. Good day, sirs. Come along inside, girls. Especially you, Jane. I was surprised to discover your sudden return from Netherfield. I should have known nothing about it if I had not happened to see Mr Jones's shop boy in the street who told me that they were not to send any more drafts because the Miss Bennets were come away. Oh, I am well recovered, aunt. Oh, this is our cousin, Mr Collins, who is staying with us. What do you know of Mr Wickham, aunt? I can only tell you what you most likely already know. Mr Denny has brought him from London and that he is to have a lieutenant's commission here with the regiment. I promise to make Mr Phillips call on him this evening and give him an invitation to dine with us tomorrow, if you will join us also. And you, Mr Collins. I must say, Mrs Phillips, I have never, excepting my esteemed patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh and her daughter... Jane, did you see the countenance of Mr Darcy upon seeing Mr Wickham? I have never seen Mr Darcy so uncomfortable. Mr Wickham, too, seemed as though all the colour left his face. It is strange. I cannot imagine there would be any prior connection between the two gentlemen. I can no more explain their behaviour than you can, Lizzie. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen was adapted and directed by Rebecca Cockcroft for White Cobra. This production was recorded separately in the performance homes to adhere to COVID regulations. Find out more about White Cobra by visiting whitecobra.co.uk. The narrator was Liz Clark, Mrs Bennett was Kate Billingham and Mr Bennett was John Myhill. Lizzie Bennett was Amy Whitestone, Lydia Bennett was Emily Rose Lyon, and Kitty Bennett and Mariah Lucas were Corinna Jane Crabtree. Jane Bennett was Rebecca Cockcroft, Sir William Lucas was Ian Spybey, Mr Bingley was Thomas Sparrow, and Mr Darcy was Tom Morrith. Mrs Hurst was Jude Wilton, Miss Bingley was Vicky Kelly, and Charlotte Lucas was Hannah Taylor. The Longbourn servant was Rebecca Cockcroft, Harris was Richard Jordan, and Mr Collins was Fraser Haynes. Denny was Martin Borley Cox, Mr Wickham was Tristan Baxter-Smith, and Mrs Phillips was Jude Wilton.